started. Uh, I'm the first of all. Thanks everyone for uh, coming and listening to this webinar. Um, we are going to be talking about hypermedia APIs, and if they're hyper reality and, and things about them, uh, this. Uh, meeting will be recorded and the replay will be available on our website, akana.com, under the resources where you can find all the rest of our uh, replay information and, and, and web, webinars. Okay? So it will be recorded. Um, hold on. Um, and there is, uh, I was getting a question here. Um, you need to dial in to well, you're not going to hear this if, uh, if you're not dialed in, but you need to dial in to hear. Um, all right, so let's get started. Um, I'm, I'm Laura Heritage. Uh, again, I um, work for Arcana. I'm the director of API strategy there. Um, so the glory of REST, this is what we all aspire to, right, the, the, or we think we should aspire to, or should we? That's the question. The Royal, um, the Roy um, Fielding's definition of rest and the Hadios. Now, this is the, um, I don't know if you've all seen this. It's getting pretty popular, but it's the Richardson's Maturity Model. You can find a detailed description um, by going to Martin Fuller's site, and you can see it down there. But I'll, I'll give you a brief um, introduction to what this maturity model says, and then we're going to um, see where you guys all fall on this maturity model. So the first level of the maturity model is the swamp of pox, which is um, plain old XML. Um, this is basically you can consider this your, your SOAP, right? Um, XML, SOAP request, post, very basic, okay? Um, the second level is where you start to introduce uh, resources. Um, this is still a level, a lot of times at, at this level, level one, you're still using really only one method, like a post. So you do a post to book and, you know, book one and, and book two, but you're, you're introducing the, the notion of resources. Level two is where you start to really introduce those HTTP verbs. So instead of just having one method, you make you make full use for your resource of get, put, post, delete, and, and some of the other um, verbs that are available like patch and and options and, and so forth. But also at this level, you start making use of proper um, pr pr proper codes, especially when something goes wrong. Not everything, everything is not a, a 200, right? Um, you, you really start to send back more information, proper information to the developer so they can understand what's going wrong in a standardized way, okay? Um, and then finally, the level three, right? This is where you get, you know, your, your full hypermedia controls um, where you achieve restfulness and hadios. Right, where everything, where resources link to other resources, you have the proper um, get, put, posts, and deletes, and and you're you're doing the proper um, uh, error re return codes, right? Um, and this is where you know really your 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 RESTful API becomes discoverable. Okay. Now. To begin with, we have to start with, in case of, for those of you on the call that are really new to this, we need, and you hear this, you hear this term a lot, and I just spoke about it, but what is Hadeus? Okay? Um, people pronounce it in many different ways. Um, some people say hate, OSA, some people say Hadeus. Um, it's, it's a, a term that can be, um, used and <laughs> can be pronounced many different ways. But really what it stands for is hypermedia as the engine um, of the application state, okay? So what this does is that every response that you make to your RESTful API includes hypermedia links to navigate the RESTful interfaces. So you usually start off with one endpoint to get the resource, and then inside that response will be all the hyper uh, links that are needed to navigate the rest of, of the resource and the APIs and what you can do. And each link within the response, um, 
you are presumed to support the, the REST verbs, get, put, post, and delete. So what you see on the right here is an example of what a, um, what a resource would look like, look like that supports Hadios. So you can see, um, I probably can't see my mouse over here, but you can see when you look at, um, there's, there's two, um, in, in this, the result set in under content, there's two resources. There's the price of an Apple tablet and the um, price of a dock for an iPad or uh, an iPhone. And you can actually navigate to each one of those individual products because there is a link there that describes where it is located at, and you can then go retrieve that information. And when you go retrieve that, it'll provide you with more links of what you can do next from that, that page. So it's a very, um, it, like you said, it, every response includes links to what you can do next. All right, I'm going to try to put up, before we go, I'm going to try to put up a poll next. Um, Hugh, can you please uh, put up the first poll question? So we're going to make this, this webinar a little um, uh, interactive so everybody on the call can see what everybody else is doing in this space. So the first question here, now that we've based, we got a quick overview of what um, Richardson's maturity model is, I'd like everybody to respond to where they think their company on a whole is on the maturity level today. So I'm going to give you uh, about 30 seconds to take a look at this and respond, and then we will show the, the results. All right, Hugh, are we getting the results in, or I'm assuming everybody's getting Yes, we getting have 65% uh, of the audience has finished. Okay, I'll give 20%, you. I mean, 28% have not started. Can we give it another second, because people are actually doing it? Okay, yep, I'll give it another second. In case you don't know where the poll question is, it's over on the right-hand side of your webinar. And the results are... <laughs> All right, so you should be able to see, I, I think you, they should be able to see the results themselves on the right-hand side. Yes, people should be able to see them. All right, so um, it's what I kind of figured it would be. Um, I kind of figured a lot of people are going to be either at the um, level two, right, where you're making use of the the verbs and maybe making use of the um, proper error return codes, or they were still going to be down at level zero um, at, of with the 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 plain old XML because of the SOAP base. I mean, SOAP is still used quite a bit in in the enterprise, um, so it's a it's a it's a good uh, good. Well, I guess I read that answer wrong. There was twenty eight percent no answer. Um, so yeah, it, you know, but still, it still is kind of where I thought um, it would be based on all of the customers that I've talked to in uh, in the market today. All right, so now we're going to continue on. You can all see the, those results, and let's move on to the next page. So why is this Hadios important? And one of the reasons that it is, uh, I think, in order to answer that question, we have to look at to how the web works today. So. Everybody knows, really. Um, you go to your web browser. We really have a, a document-based web today. 
You go to the web browser, it brings up this, this document, you read it, this document can link to other documents living on other servers, you can have multiple links going out, and you can have multiple links coming into your, um, your, your page, okay? So it's a document-based web today. So what does it really look like? Well, websites are broken up into two parts. Um, there's the HTML part, and this HTML part is what the browsers, the clients, can read and understand. And humans can read and understand um, what is going on uh, about the, the data that's displayed to them on the web page, right? And this is all due to HTML. But there's a second layer of of what's going on, it's the data part. Now, the data part is um, JSON and XML and is more understood by uh, machine uh, machines, okay? Now, I, I stole this kind of uh, bit, how this is broken out here from a YouTube video that does a really good job um, from Jason LD explaining, um, explaining this. So if you want a more deeper understanding um, and the, uh, a good video to, to read and understand how this works, um, uh, go to that YouTube video. It's a, it's a, great, it's a great little five-minute uh, five video that explains this a little bit more. But the gist is there's HTML, which is human-readable and understood stood by several clients, right? You've got all of your red, web browsers. And... Um, you've got data, which is down at the bottom. Hold on a second. So HTML provides the standards that we all adhere to. This is why all these clients can create, can, can work and create things that interpret HTML. And when you change your web page, why it doesn't break. Changing your web page doesn't break the client, right? any of one of your, your browsers or anything that understands HTML. Um, and HTML also has a, um, extensions, some extensions to it, like um, um, extensions that allow you to tag the content within the HTML page so that other things, other clients like search engines and um, uh, bots and things like that can actually read and understand the data that is presented to you from that from that client. Okay, it's the data. Bottom line: when you change your HTML page, your client doesn't break. Okay, the browser doesn't break. It's there. Your experience: people might not like what you did to your page. Right? It might be horrible. You might actually broke your own page, but you didn't break. You didn't break the client. It still works as it should, interpreting the HTML. But what about the data? Remember I said the websites are made of two parts. It's made of the HTML part, which, you know, you've got your browsers and your clients and your human-readable things that you can do. But then there's the data part that actually produces and makes, can produce and make that HTML or just be the data itself. What are, you know, if we're supposed to be striving to this Hades, what are the standards to link data? How do you, how are you supposed to structure your JSON? How are you supposed to structure your XML so that some client can read it and understand it and you can make changes to the data you present but don't break your clients? Well, that's the problem. There's no standards. There's no clients. So when we make changes to our um, APIs, things break. Okay? So, API um, hypermedia standards are born, or attempts at standards. Now, when I've been doing my first, I want to I, I want to caveat this. When I when I did my research around um, API description languages, I, I I kind of find some personal opinions, but they are not the opinions of Akana, and we're not backing any single one of one of these things. You know, Akana is like Switzerland when it when it comes to API description language and hypermedia. We 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 support um we're with them all. Um and uh but I'll I'll probably do some color commentary based on my personal opinions um as as I go through um some of these hypermedia languages. Okay. So there's been a lot of attempts Okay, if you, you just take a look at um, the, the general hypermedia types that, that are on the market today and, and some, you know, some very, very new um, capabilities. I list, list them in alphabetical order here um, just to keep it neutral. 
as well. So you've got things like collection JSON, HAL, JSON LD, JSON API, you know, more recently Siren and Uber and so forth. But then you also have some industry media types. So those are general, the general media type, media types fit are, are supposed to be across industry, right? Across basically anything, just a basic way, general way to design your APIs. But then you have industry media types, like the fire. I've been working a lot with the fire, um, um, media type, Russell media type. Um, actually it's quite nice to work with. I, I, I enjoy it. Um, and, and voice, uh, voice XML. So there's some industry specific things going on, um, so that it makes it easier for, you know, the, within the industry to communicate and, and work together. And then you have company media types, right? So then you've got things like um, GitHub and Heroku who are basically standardizing on their own way to represent, um, you know, to, to reach this ADS and, and hypermedia um, realm, right, to, to get the glory of REST and make their lives easier with um, clients that make it easier to support. So... Hold on one second while I flip the page. So um, as we go forward here, um, you, when you look at hyper, the, so I'm going to focus on the, the general or generic hyper media types that are out on the market today. Um, and each one has a different goal. Each one was created to fit a particular purpose. And you, when, when you're trying to pick which hypermedia type, if you're going to use a generic, you know, generic or general hypermedia type, um, you really have to try to look at the purpose and what's the goal of that hypermedia type and how does it relate to what you are trying to do and your market and, and how your data is related. Okay. Now, one of the oldest hypermedia types out there is OData, and I'm seeing OData come up quite a few times in my my customers lately. It was born in 2012 and 2010 by Microsoft. Um, it started basically as a data um, API for Microsoft Azure, um, and it's just it, it's just been around a while, right? It basically again, its goal was it was a data um, a data API. Then next came uh, Collection Plus. Um, Jason uh, in 2011 by Mike Amundsen, brilliant guy, very strong leader in the in the hypermedia uh, community and an excellent speaker. Uh, his media, it, it, this first attempt at a, a media type for Mike was really focused around um, simple collections, right? Even though it does other things. That, but um, other than collections, it was really around the management and querying of simple collections. So that was in 2011. Also around that time, HAL came about, right? Hypertext Application Language, 2011 by Mike Kelly. Now, this was – his theory was he used the KISS principle, right? And really it is. It is the KISS principle. It is easy to understand. Um, easy to use, uh, a simple way to, to link resources, right? So his is, you want a simple um, hypermedia uh, to get started on? HAL is, is a great resource to, to, to work with. Next came Siren in 2012, okay? Now, um, the thing about Siren, where Siren introduced uh, things was it was, the, when you look at HAL, HAL was just about linking the data. What Siren introduced was the ability to specify what actions in the requ in the response that you got from your when you make a request and you get your response. Not only do you have links to what you can do, but you have actions that you can do and take, and it tells you what to do. So that's where actions really started to form. Um, in 2013 with JSON API, uh, the, the focus of this, this was by Steve and, um, and team. Steve is an excellent speaker and has some great documents as well, and I, I'll tell you a little bit about that, those later. I, I make some references later in the presentation. But the goal of the JSON API was really to um, reduce the amount of requests 
and the data transmitted between the clients. Because one of the things about hypermedia, it can get pretty chatty and pretty um, a lot of data streaming back and forth. And you will see that when I list the, the pros and cons of hypermedia. Um, then we uh, just recently in 2013 as well, we have uh, the notion of JSON LD linked with Hydra. Those two things work together. This is really about giving um, – JSON LD is really about giving context to the, the content um, that is coming through the the data the data that is coming uh through so you'll we'll talk a little bit more about that later finally um just two brand new ones at the end of last year was mason that really takes um how to the next level adding actions to it but it's based it kept with a simplicity notion um on top of how and then mike amundsen created another uh hypermedia type with uber and what what he was trying to do with Uber is move beyond hypermedia to be protocol agnostic, especially in this um, Internet of Things world. It, uh, you know, being HDF does not um, define you or limit you to, to HTTP. It, it actually can be quite open. So that is where Uber's um, Uber's goals are. So when you're picking a hypermedia API type look at the goals of what each language was trying to, um, which each standard was trying to do. Okay, so what to look for in a hypermedia type? Okay, so I kind of went over it a little bit above, but basically there are three things, and this is my opinion, three things you got to look for. One is linkage. They all have linkages. That's the essence of hypermedia, okay? So granted, everyone does links, but it's how they represent their links and, and so forth. That's the interesting bit that you need to look at. The second thing you need to look at is if it supports actions, right? Um, when you make a request, a response, does it tell you what you can do on that hyperlink and how you can do it and what is required and, and things like that? Now, the third thing is the, the profile bit. This puts um, context or semantics around the data that's getting back. Okay, I'm going to speak a little bit more on that in this next slide. So profiles is um, an RFC specification 6906. Basically, again, it's to give semantics to the content that's coming back. So when a client gets something back that says first name, if it knows and can access a profile and say, oh, that's example.net name, I know what first name is. Um, a lot of the problems with the uh, hypermedia um, links, uh, you know, when it first started, when hypermedia first started, okay, great, you can link, right, and clients can understand following different links, but it didn't understand, well, are what you meaning by name, first name, is it the same thing I mean by first name, is, or what do you mean by ID, and so forth. So there's these profiles that are being um, created that allow you to say, okay, I'm following this profile, so when I mean name, this is name. And this gives your client the context and the assurance of of, of how to work and, and move about things. So, again, the hypermedia languages, there's those three things that you need to look for, the linkage, the actions, and the availability of supporting profile. Okay. So, now I took a, a poll about what is supported um, and if they have a registered media, uh, media type. Okay. OData. And it's kind of important to understand if they support XML and JSON as well. So OData, you can see the media types it supports. It supports XML and JSON. You know, I couldn't find out actually if it supports actions or profiles. I didn't. I didn't think so, but somebody can correct me if I'm wrong here. Um, I, I just OData is one of those more complicated uh, uh, media types and focuses on searching and querying. Um, data. Uh, it's got strong capabilities there. Uh, if you can see collection JSON, it, uh, it, it supports its JSON and actions. Um, I believe it does XML too, but I didn't get the, the, um, there's, there's not a lot of examples. Um, HAL does XML, JSON, and it supports profile. Remember, it's focused on simplicity, so it didn't put actions in there. Uh, Siren, does all four of those things, XML, JSON. Um, 
JSON API specifically supports JSON, and it supports profiles. Okay. Again, its whole notion was reducing the amount of data and the um, the number of requests that you have to make. Throwing actions in there would make it large, because um, it does. It makes it large. Um, JSON LD, you have to pair that with Hydra, and then you'll get actions. It supports profiles and it supports JSON. Mason, um, it basically again is that how it, you know it's taken how to the next level. It supports JSON and actions and profiles, and Uber uh, again supports all all four um, of those capabilities. Now, when you're picking a hypermedia language uh, or standard, whatever you want to call it, um, you need to look at the communities and the tools and clients available. Okay. So, I when I when I said we'll look at the communities, um, there's actually two communities. There's the actual community itself of the the standard, and then there's what's going on socially about it in the API community. So that's why. I thought I needed to tag it in two different ways because OData has a very, very large active community. It's been around a long, long time. But when you talk about hypermedia um, APIs in the, the API community, it's rarely ever mentioned. Okay, it's not. It, it, so, so that kind of that kind of kind of makes you think. Well, what what's going on there? Okay, um, you know. Why not? Okay. Um, again, you can see I put references in here for you, and again, this presentation will be um, posted so you can get this. The, the tools OData has a large amount of tools, too many to list, too, too many to, you know, lots of clients, both server-side tools, um, client-side tools, and actual clients themselves. Um, collection JSON, the community activity is, is pretty low. Um, the the social mentions in the API community pretty low. Um, it has uh, some reference tools available. Um, I would say it's limited on all of them, but there it does have some. Hal Hal is high active community and also developer community and very high mention in the API community. Okay, um, you can go. There's tons. There's you know. Similar to OData, um, there are too many um, server-side tools, client tools, um, and clients available to list. HAL actually has a really nice browser. So if you have a hypermedia, it's called HAL Talk. It has a really nice browser that allows you to navigate um, navigate your APIs in a, in a nice graphical format, similar to how you would do a Swagger or a RAML um, Browsing of, of those type of documents. Siren, um, I you know the community is actually low. Community activity is low, or maybe it's just hard to find. Right? It's not as nicely listed out of tools and things um, like Hal Hal has. Um, its social men mentions are you know it's it's medium. It's not as high as Hal, but it's you know it's it gets mentioned. Um, Again, it's not as easy to find. I, you know, I focus my search trying to do some GitHub stuff, and um, but it's it's out there. It's just hard to find. API um, JSON, I mean JSON API. Sorry, the other way around. API JSON. It's a medium um, community. It's it's uh, very you know very nice uh, laid out. You can you can find. Um, some server side tools, some client side tools, um, some clients. Again, it's, it's got a good base, but it's not as big as um, HAL or OData. Um, it's mentions in the social community. Um, I have low, but you know, it's borderline. It's borderline medium. Um, JSON LD. It's it's got medium activity. Um, from a community perspective and medium activity from uh, a, a social mentions. It is one of the, I would say, more forward-thinking forward, forward thinking, um, hypermedia things. I mean, you really you need to pair it with, with Hydra. Um, but, you know, it's got a great interactive tool. It's got several um, GitHub repositories. 
though they're not well organized. It's not as easy. They're kind of hard to find. Um, but again, it's a, it's a for, I, I would say it's one of those forward thinking hypermedia types. It takes a little, takes a little bit more brain power <laughs> to, to understand it than I would say than uh, the siren or, or how, um, something to it. Um, but, uh, it's, uh, like I said, it's, it's forward thinking. Um, Mason, you know, Mason and Uber are just, way too new to really gauge um they're getting they're getting mentioned in i say it's low mentioned in the api um community but i can see it um you know moving up in in the next year i think this year is going to be a a big year for for hypermedia as more and more people um start to realize its value i've i've seen um for myself in the last 3 months a lot more um from enterprise customers uh, working with hypermedia. Okay, now I think I think I was going to do. Let me check my notes here. If I was going to do, I'll, I'll wait for for another poll. Um, so what I did here is in the next few slides, I put some examples of what a response would look like from each one of these uh, media types. Um, so this is an OData example. Um, one of the things, you know, this is a personal opinion. One of the things I'm not a fan of from from OData is how it puts filters and queries in the the, the base URL um, base URL part like this. I know it's pro it, you can do it and stuff, but some of the things it does with the URLs is kind of funky. Um, and and so, but that. That, that's old data. This is what old data looks like. Um, here's a, an example of JSON, uh, collection JSON. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. You know, you can see your, you know, what the resource is and, and you can see this is dealing with a collection and being able to navigate those collections. Uh, here's a HAL example. One of the easiest, um, uh, hypermedia, uh, languages to learn. Um, they have these things called queries, which help simplify um, simplify your your um, hyper your, your response, um, so that you don't have to put the namespace um, all through. So, for example, here we see EA. Um, that's that's the namespace right here. So you could take this order, um, put order up there, call that URL, and you could understand. Um, what order is it provides some documentation right there in line about what what that order is so it's very easy very nice simple to use um here's siren it gets a little bit more interesting um where you have resources you can have embedded entities and then this is where down here is you specify what actions you you can perform and then what is required to do so right so it gives a little bit more but it makes your makes your response a little bit more thicker Um, back here, it also, if you can see, you can see uh, one of the things specifies navigation. Uh, you can point to yourself and where the next, especially when you're going over collections. Here's the next, here's the previous, and so forth. Um, this is JSON API. This is this one again was to reduce the number of HTTP requests, so it sends back more information, and then also so it doesn't repeat the information within the response. It um, does these linkages, so you can see that what well, this entity up here relates to this shows this linkage to people number nine. So you can go down here to people number nine. So if you had another um, entity that re referenced people number nine. Um, with ID number nine, um, you, you're only going to have it once in your response, and you, you go and find it. It's not repeated multiple times. So it greatly simplifies um, the amount of data, amount of requests that you have to go go back and forth, and reduces the um, um, the actual response as well as for you know when they they were designing it, um, it was mo they had mobile in mind. Um, here's the Hydra and um, JSON LD. Uh, Hydra has a nice browser as well. Uh, most of these hypermedia language types are um, providing browsers similar to what you'd say Swagger um, or the, the RAML um, browsers, description language browsers, so you can easily navigate um, the APIs. 
Uh, here's a uh, Mason example. Again, this takes how and adds uh, actions to it. And uh, finally, here's here's Uber. And Uber, I point out that it's using um, a profile which describes people and places, and you can see how it relates. Um, profiling is is quite is is quite an interesting concept um, for for hypermedia. Okay, so with that, Hugh, I think I'd like you to put up the next. Um, can we put up two two of them at the same time, or can you only do one poll at a time? Um, I have them as set up as one at a time. Okay, um, well, but can you put up the next one, please, then? Okay. So, I actually, I meant to do this one before. So, right now, how well do you think you know hypermedia APIs? Okay. And try to answer these pretty quickly. Um, I'll give you about a minute. Well, we're waiting for that poll. You know, before I started, and I was going to talk about this a little bit later, but I might as well do it now. Before I started really um, looking into hypermedia and really investigating all of these um, these media types, when I would go to API Strats or something and hear them talking about the hypermedia and how it's going to um, change the world and clients are going to never break and so forth. I thought, yeah, 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 right. I was kind of one of those those naysayers. Um, but now that I've uh, really investigated into it, I, I think there's a very relevant place, and it doesn't have to be the the pie in the sky. You know, we're going to have a semantic web where machines are just going to automatically. Um, go and discover things for us and, you know, somebody builds a client, it should never break type of thing. Uh, I, I think there's some really practical and, and, um, useful things that enterprise, especially enterprises who actually own their clients can do and make use of, um, these hypermedia concepts. I, I think it would save, um, I, I think it would save a lot of time and heartache and, and, um, when when you need to make changes. So I kind of been a during this exercise of of creating this presentation and and doing a lot of research, I I kind of became a convert to um being a naysayer to being someone that um thinks it's a real possibility um the futures. Okay, so how well do you think you know hypermedia? So we've got out of 77 people um I wish the results would appear nicer in this browser, um, out of out of 77 people, 36% are just starting to investigate, 25% are somewhat familiar, and and 5% are well-versed. So um, I I think that's really good that I'm, I'm so glad people are starting to investigate and somewhat familiar because probably some of you are naysayers like me, but just keep investigating, and I think you'll, you'll be – become a convert, maybe not of one particular language, but of the of, of the concept itself. Um, can you put out the next question, and then I'll continue on with my presentation while that question is being answered. Okay. Okay. So, um, as you know from, from my previous webinars, I do uh, a lot with um, API description languages. Again, you know, Akana isn't um, for a particular one. Uh, we support um, the Whistle, Waddle, Raml, and so forth. We are um, in Swagger. We're kind of like Switzerland there as well. Um, but uh, you know, how does how how does this hypermedia affect API description languages? Do you need them anymore? If your um, hypermedia API, if you have hypermedia APIs, right? Because supposedly with hypermedia APIs, it's, you know, self-discovering all the documentation that you need should be in there. Well, let's take a look at what hypermedia, uh, um, what, sorry, what API description languages serve. I think they serve four aspects. They act as a blueprint 
for how to design your APIs. They act as a contract between you, you and your consumer. They act as metadata, so allowing um, machines, other machines, other things to understand what it, what your APIs can do. And they are, provide human readability, right? Especially in the design phase, when you're designing your APIs and in the consumption phase. So, so for, you know, for the blueprint, again, how you design your APIs. Um, yeah, so I just, I just went through all of that. Um, I'm going to get ahead of myself. I always do this. So those are the four aspects that, that API description languages serve. Now, how does hypermedia serve these same aspects. So for a blueprint, um, some of the hypermedia la languages, well, all of the hypermedia basically dictate the, the structure of your APIs, of what, you, you know, your URLs and so forth can look, look like. And the toughest thing that happens is figure, you know, that you have to do is figuring out your backend systems. And the, the data model becomes a difficult part. Um, uh, of what you you need to do, especially I've talking to customers with that that are using O data, and that's what they say. Well, O data kind of dictates, you know, once you figure out your data model, it dictates what your API to use. So actually designing and using a blueprint to figure out your APIs, you you, you don't really need that. I I don't think that goes as well um, as the same as other API description languages, but um, you know, so the blueprints you, you could kind of say, ah, uh, well, you know, it could you might not need a, a blueprinting capability, right? Um, so contract. Really, hypermedia doesn't have anything here. When you're designing your APIs, which kind of goes back to the blueprint, and you're making that contract with your consumer, uh, especially your consumer one, uh, hypermedia doesn't really have anything that can that provides that con contracting type capability. Second, media. Uh, media, metadata, sorry, metadata. If there was a standard, right, if there was like one standard like HTML, this would be taken care of because everything would be a client for it. But there's not, right? You've got, you saw before, we've got, you know, six to ten very, you know, relevant hypermedia types out on the market and depending what you want to do. So there is not one that all of the vendors, the tool vendors like, like Smart Bear or us um, to really grab onto and pull in. So we need something like a, um, you know, like a more proven thing like Swagger or Raml or Wizzle or Waddle to really help us understand what your um, APIs do and how you want to apply security and, and so forth on them or how, you know, you pull them down into your your testing tools and, and, and so forth. Um, I think this will change once some of the one or two of the hypermedia types pull ahead. People start building client, more and more clients for them. I mean, OData is kind of kind of getting there already. Um, as far as human readability and and documentation, you know, the hypermedia API by itself is it says it's supposed to be human readable, but you know, it's 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 really not. I think it's up to, you know, you, you have to really, unless you have one of those browsers, um, you know, it's, it's kind of difficult to, to dive through and figure out all of the, what the API um, can do. And then, then there's, it's missing some, um, it, it's missing some of the things like, being able to uh, define a JSON schema or or an XML schema or something that really tells you what's going on or um, have embedded examples and so forth. And so that's where uh, API description language really comes in as a powerful way to encapsulate your descriptions and your schemas and, and so forth. So what does hypermedia mean for API description languages? I think, personally, I think API description languages are still necessary, at least for a while. It's what developers expect when viewing an API, um, though there are some hypermedia client browsers like HalTalk, which is a good start. There's, um, you know, but still that doesn't provide um, schemas and examples for the API. Um, 
Most enterprise systems, such as security gateways, cloud integration, testing tools, like I said before, are not hypermedia clients today, uh, but they do understand API description languages, okay? Hypermedia can act as a contract between a consumer and provider, okay? So my recommendation for you is while you have a hypermedia API, you're still going to need to describe that API in an API description language from a consumption perspective um, for the reasons I just mentioned above, right, um, until until there is a clear winner in that realm like HTML, right? Um, it's just, it's just going to be necessary. So arguments for hypermedia. Make sure API is more flexible, right? So if you want to add um, something, a new thing to your resource, you add it and clients can interpret it or they can ignore it. Now, there is a thing saying that it won't break your client. It will break your client if you make a crazy um, change to your, your API, a non-backwards compatible change to your API. So depending on what what you're doing, you you isolate yourself from from breaking your clients a bit, but if you make a crazy change, it's going to break your client. Um, it enables discoverability. So, yeah, if you if you are a very, very technical person and you've got your Russell endpoint and you can go navigate and discover all the things that you need, it's very great. It's, it's easy, and it allows for um, if you have a client that understands it and can navigate, makes it very easy. Um, it says it replaces the need for documentation as a benefit. To some extent, I don't say, again, I don't think it replaces all, but it does uh, a bit. Um, and the other benefit, it is true rest. Okay, so those are arguments for hypermedia. Now, like I said before, I was a naysayer, and uh, I'm, I'm getting to be a convert because I don't think of these benefits in the I, I, idealistic way, right? I'm not going for the pie in the sky. I'm thinking of them in very practical senses when, when you're, especially for enterprises. Okay, and I'll get to that in a minute. So arguments against hypermedia. It creates more work. It is tougher to build a hypermedia API, at least for now until we get the hang of it. It requires more data transfer, so, um, you know, you have to be careful of that. But there's a hypermedia type that does uh, account for that. Um, Creating an API uh, um, for a client that doesn't exist. That's the biggest thing, right? So you pick a hypermedia a media type and there's no clients out there that that understands it, right? So you are responsible for helping your developers and creating a client that they can leverage and use to 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 use your API. Okay? Now this isn't so bad. If you're an enterprise and you're and you own the clients and the people, if it's an internal, um, if it's an API that's used internally, I don't think that's a bad thing. You can create the client, and you've got control, and it gives you lots of flexibility, a lot of flexibility. Um, no one knows how to use hypermedia. That's just a point-in-time statement. I, I, like I said, in the last few months, it is, I've seen more and more enterprises really understanding hypermedia. And the more people, re, you know, I'm hoping I'm putting bugs in people's, Years and to go investigate a, a little bit more and um, and and see you know what what this is all about okay um, and there's no clear leader in in the standard so you you know you're gonna have a tough time figuring out which one of these that you want to use so we did get the results back if you're using hypermedia today um, 16 percent uh, of those answered said. Yes, so out of 70, out of 76 people, um, we've got 12 people that said they're using it and 32 no. Can you put up the next question while we, uh, next poll as we go on? Okay. Are you planning on using hypermedia APIs in the near future? So it's a yes or no question, so it shouldn't take you that long to answer. Um, so continue on. So there's no clear, clear leader in hypermedia um, APIs standards. So, okay. So this is my favorite part. And this is where, for me, I read I, – I recommend everybody go read this article here. It's by Steve 
um, Klebnik, and it's it's wonderful. Are you already using some of the hypermedia con- concepts? And I, I bet you you are. Okay, um, images, right? So if your if your API returns a, a data that says, okay, you've got pictures. Here's your three choices, and the client can decide. You're using a hypermedia concept right there. Okay, um, you're not hard coding it. You're giving your client a choice. They know to go to picture, and they can choose which one. Um, pagination. If you're doing any type of pagination in your API, this is a basic hypermedia concept. You're already using it. Now, this is where it really, really hit home to me, right, is um, Steve was telling about a story that um, where he first introduced some hypermedia when he was building an OS, um, iOS app, right, um, in the iOS app, you had to go through, uh, he had to go through um, a certification with Apple, and Apple only allowed them to stream a certain quali- uh, quality of, of uh, video, right? And the quality of the video that they wanted to stream was a, ho- a lot higher quality than what um, Apple would certify. And so their solution to it was during certification, um, they hyperlinked out to lower quality videos, and then after certification, they had were able to switch without having to change their 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 clients at all, right? Their app at all, they could switch it out to higher quality. I did this concept all the way back in 1999, actually with my um, with some of my soap based APIs. Okay, so if you ever you know, if, and I know everybody's been in there, especially if you work in a large organization where you don't have access to production systems, right? So you've got something you want to change, but it's locked down because of operations. You know, the operations team says, no, oh, no, you can't have access to the server, or no, no, you can't do this. You know, I used to put hyperlinks all over so I could put files out and pull those files in and tell my client what to do. Um, instead of, so I didn't have to change my client, I could change my file on a server that I had access to, and I just deployed the stuff, um, you know, to the operations team. So it's just, it's stuff that we're doing already, especially in enterprises, that you're doing to work around operations folks and so forth, um, or because it's too expensive to redeploy, or maybe you need to, like you said, you need to change something after you've certified it, right? I know not all these things are kosher, but from a development perspective, we've been employing this type of hyperlinking a long time, right? It, it just makes sense to do. So it's it's a great article, great examples, and it really makes it hit home on the benefits of, of being able to hyperlink out to things, out to resources, being able to change things without breaking your clients. So are you ready for hypermedia? Okay. Again, I'm going to – this is from, from that article. Um, do you have to base your whole API strategy on hypermedia? Does it have to be, you know, just as it says, do you have to make it a fundamental underlying theory of your whole, whole API? I don't think so. It doesn't have to be that way. You can gain some advantages of hypermedia without doing an entire overhaul. And I think that is the best advice out there, and I think that's the least scary advice out there. It gives enterprises, people that can't move and can't create things from scratch and throw it away so easily, easily, it gives them, it gives you a way to start employing some of these things, to start getting some of the benefits without a significant investment. So it's great advice from Steve, and really was an aha moment for myself. Um, so what are your, you know, what are your options for adopting hypermedia? Maybe you're sitting out there thinking, oh, you know, I'd love to do it, but I just don't, you know, I just don't know, okay? Well, what, you got option one, do nothing. Stay at level two maturity, right, with get, put, post, delete, deletes, or what people are calling, sometimes call pragmatic rest, and wait for a clear standard. That's always a valid option, okay? Uh, two, uh, continue employing hypermedia concepts as needed. Do as Steve suggested. Employ some bits of hypermedia in your API to give you some flexibility and see how it goes, okay? 
Um, and you can do this in a couple different ways. You can create your own um, company specific hypermedia type, right? Like GitHub, Heroku, something that's very specific to you. You can propose an industry hypermedia type and register it. Okay, for example, like Fire, but this is only going to work if your industry, um, if your industry is an industry that likes to cooperate with each other. Okay, if you've got industries that are in competition, they are not going to want to do this. Okay, that's not going to be an option for you. Um, one of the things you can do is adopt uh, one of the basic and simplistic standards that only focus on on linkage, really. Like how, well, Siren has some um, actions into it, but it's pretty basic, or JSON API. And maybe add your own extensions, okay? Um, so start out and use one of the, the one of one of the more popular basic standards and try it out from there, okay? Again, you don't have to base your whole fundamental theory on it, okay? Um, or you can try, if you're in your advance, you can try adopting one of the more forward-thinking hypermedia types, right, like um, Uber or JSON-LD or Hydra, okay? So that's that's kind of my, you know, that, that's the options that you have on, on your plate today on how you want to get started. So are you planning on um, employing hypermedia types, hypermedia APIs? 40% said yes out of the people that responded, and 20% said uh, Almost 20% said no. Can you post the next uh, question as well? And I'll post these results after the the webinar. And I can open uh, open the if we have got some. I'm gonna op get some questions here while we're let's post the poll. All right, this is a poll. I'm one of the polls I'm most interested in. Which hypermedia type do you? Um, or do you use or do you plan to use? Okay, that's going to be a really interesting one um, that I'm, I'm interested in looking at. All right, so uh, I've got like one minute. Let me see. Is there one question that's out there? That would be easy. Laura, also perhaps can you share that you'll you'll write a blog post that addresses some of the other questions if you can't get to them? Yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. So one of the questions is, um, do you think all of this will make very um, – do you think all of this will make very concise REST APIs bloated just like SOAP? You know what? I honestly, maybe not just like SOAP, but until there's an easy standard like HTML that that is, is that arises, right? For for the data, yeah, I think there is a is a very big risk there. But you know, one of the things that I'm gonna I'm gonna quote uh, Mike Amundsen. You know, he's he's come up with a, a couple different standards. Um, hypermedia standards, Uber and, and collection JSON, and he says, you know, th this is very young. It's a very young, um, in essence, right? I know REST has been around for a while, but people focusing on hypermedia is very young, and so we're going to have a lot of churn for hypermedia types. And I think uh, right now we've got we we've got two ends of the spectrum. We've got very simple. Um, hypermedia types, things to understand, like HAL and, and Siren and JSON, and on the other side, but there's some things missing from them, but on the other side, we've got some very advanced, um, you know, forward-thinking hypermedia types, like Uber and JSON, uh, LD with Hydra, and I would even think, you know, um, OData. I, it's most popular because it's out there, it's been out there for a while, and there's a lot of tools, but Consuming one of those APIs is, I don't think, is fun, um, and it, it's a it's a little bit more advanced. So I think we're going to see a lot of change, and I think there's there's yeah, it's it's going to it, it needs to be the standard that finally emerges needs to be simple enough, um, but yet complete enough. And I don't think we've reached it with the the ones that uh, the ones that are out there yet. So that's my opinion. 
Okay, so my last question, did, did the last poll come out? Hugh? Yeah, one second. Off. Yeah. All right. So you can all see the distribution of what people are are using. I'm curious on the other if it's um if it's like an industry API um industry media type or if it's uh company media type, but that's uh that that's very interesting to me. But um if you have more questions feel free to shoot them in the the chat window. I will take a, a chance at um answering them and uh post them to a blog. Otherwise you can always um contact me and email me directly directly. So thank you very much. Thank you.